Hi, Priya. Hi, Susan. Hi, um, Libby. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Tomcat. <laughs> Hi, Jose. Hi, David Lasky. David Lasky and I share a birthday, December 8th. Any, any other December 8ths here? Anybody else? Uh, do, you, do you know any cartoonists who were born on December 8th besides Stefan Gruber and David Lasky? Popeye creator E.C. Sagar. And who's the other nonsense person? James Thurber. James Thurber. December 8th. That's right. December 17th, that's nice. Cool. There's gotta be a haiku in there. <laughs> you think there's a haiku in there somewhere? Could be. There's always a, you know, whenever David Lasky is here, there's always a haiku. <laughs> there's always one hiding somewhere. <laughs> hmm. Oh my hey, gosh. Stephen, hey, um, faces. What a bunch of sweethearts. Oh my gosh. Hi, Jeannie. Hi, Dot. Hi, Candace. Nice garden, Candace. <laughs> the flowers are blooming. And man, it just keeps on going and going. Nice, nice group of people. I think we're ready to start. Are we ready to start? It's four o'clock exactly. My name. Hey. Hello. Hey, Stefan. Usually, yeah. uh, um, I'm, I'm Michael. We met an email. Yeah. Do a brief. You a brief saw intro and then i'll hand it over to I would you love that okay saw away and i'll uh make you co-host so you have all the co-host oh, powers remember that comic okay let's see um we did saw logs hi everybody welcome to the uh saw friday night comics I'm Michael, a volunteer here at SAW. I'm trying to go into presentation mode and make this real smooth and do fantastic. Here we go. Yeah, uh, for those of you who are new to SAW, we're, we're a school, we're happening. Uh, we have events and classes uh, all the time, including tonight's, which happens weekly. Um, we have uh, uh, Lilo's mentoring group is starting in April. We have a, a graphic novel uh, program starting in uh, soon. Um, and we have ongoing groups like the Saw Flow group and the Memoir and Graphic Medicine group. Um, the, I believe that we're accepting uh, applicants for the six month graphic novel development intensive which is a very exciting course that I took in 2020. Um, we survive um, from tuition and donations from people like you. You can support SAW through our PayPal address, um, uh, our Patreon, and you can also find us on our website, members.sawcomics.org. Um, please, no inappropriate speech or imagery. You will be permanently banned and removed. Um, it only happened once in our, the, in our first Friday night workshop. And it wasn't your fault, right? It, no, no, there was a Zoom bomber. Oh, um, God, so, so we have all these extra security measures now. So uh, thanks for coming. Enjoy. And I'm handing it over to you, Stefan. Hi, thank you, Michael. I'm Stefan. I use they, them pronouns. And thank you, Sequential Artists Workshop. And uh, thank you, Tom, also for bringing me on board for this. I am gonna be doing a workshop. The topic is animation with stuff laying around your house. The materials you may need if you wanna kind of zoom around and find some things are a notebook like this. You could also use the corner of a book that you don't mind drawing in. Maybe you have an old textbook or something that's uh, okay to draw in. And if you're missing something like that, you could also do something like a post-it note pad like so. You're gonna need that and you're gonna need a dark colored pen. So I really like the Pilot Precise pen. That's why I'm showing it off. 
I go to sleep with one of these things going like this. My favorite pen. So that's something that you may need and you may want. I'm going to introduce myself a little more in depth. I am Stefan Gruber. I'm non-binary using the they, them pronouns. So, um, so yeah, been doing that for about five years now and it very much is the center of my being. It feels very good. And Seattle is full of little bubbles that really affirm that for me. And it feels, it feels really good. So yeah, and we're, we're the day after Trans Day of Visibility. So it's back to invisibility. So, and yeah, so I am an animator and I am a comics maker and I am an educator. I have been working in the Seattle Public Schools. I started an experimental animation department there 20 years ago. Wow. And I'm still teaching at this wonderful school called Nova, which is a school of punks and free thinkers. And we have a completely democratically run program where the kids have equal vote on the balancing of the budget, the hiring of teachers, mm -hmm. and they have equal vote with teachers amongst all those things. So really the mm -hmm. students have majority vote. And I was a student there. And this is the 50th year that the school has been around. And I was a student there in the 1990s. And I'm very proud to be at that school. It's a very LGBTQ plus friendly school. And I, I just feel very at home there. And me and my partner both work there. And David Lasky, who is here, has also worked there teaching a fantastic comics program. And we've had a lot of wonderful artists work there. And also around 20 years ago, I started a group in Seattle called the Seattle Experimental Animation Team. And the group of us were people who make animation as an art form and like to make animation for museums and libraries and to go on tour with the, sort of like an indie band. You just go on tour with a projector and put a, put a big screen over a fence and do a show in a backyard and get a live musician to play along with you. And that's, that's what I was, that's how I have toured my animations primarily. That is how I have gone about doing it. And so I have done probably 200 shows or so driving from Seattle down to California and back. And I've gone from Seattle driven to New York city and then back through, uh, through, the mountains of Canada, doing shows in people's backyards, museums, um, libraries, any place that would take me essentially. And then what I do is set up my own merch table and have somebody helping me sell merch and come get a big old uh, sheet and throw it over the fence, get a projector. Sometimes if it's really hot, we had to like pack the projector with a bunch of ice packs and then everybody stands around, we got a PA system. And then the way I liked to do it is I would give a menu out to the audience. And I've made so many animation pieces that at this point they can look at this menu and just call out the kind of pieces that they would like to see. And so for years and years and years, that's been my way, my personal way of subverting the idea of that once you're done with a film, your only real way to share it is either online or in a film festival. Neither, once, neither which of those really made me feel like I was part of it. It was more like at that point, it's just like, okay, you know, it's out there and I don't get to be a part of it. But doing these tours made it so that I could be like right there and answer questions and present it and talk a little bit about it ahead of time. And I would like to share an animation piece with you all this afternoon, this evening for some of you. And we'll see if I can run this fairly easily. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna share screen. 
and I am going to make sure that I share sound because that's the easiest thing to mess up when you share the screen. Here we go, share. Are we good? People seeing stuff? And you can still hear me? Yes. Cool. All right, so I'm coming over here to show you my Vimeo page. And I am just starting to take some of these films that I've felt precious about and only have wanted to share in live settings. And I'm just now starting to take those and put them onto online on my Vimeo page. So in the tradition of a menu, I would like to share with you that I have three pieces that I would recommend tonight. And in the chat, you could tell me which one you would wanna see. One of them is a three minute film, it's called Edible Rocks. And it's about the time that I tricked my little brother into believing that there are some rocks you can eat. And it is made with charcoal and pencil and it's all hand drawn and it's a true story. Solar Utopias is a, my most recent film and it's made in Procreate and hand drawn and assembled in After Effects. And it is a more abstract film that launches off of the concept behind my family's failed solar energy company from the 1970s. And it's, it goes into this idea of what if they had survived and how would our solar utopia be in the future if, uh, if these kinds of programs could thrive, which they still can. And Aniel is a three minute film that is about, um, it's about the times that I learned how to resurrect dead ladybugs in France in my early 20s. So if I can see the chat, here it is. Do, do, do. Here it is. Edible rocks, edible rocks. Ooh, Aniel, Aniel. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Anybody want to uh, count up the votes on this for me? I see so many animals. Yeah, oh, and ones. Okay, I think it's between edible rocks and Aniel. I see a lot of edible rocks. So let's do edible rocks. Does that sound good? Just show them all. I don't have time. I, I, will, I wanna do more though. I would love to do these again. So I'm gonna do Edible Rocks because I see a lot of votes for that. So when I was about 20 and my little brother was about five, I went over to Bainbridge Island and I brought him a gift. I went to a little toy shop on the way there and they have at this toy shop little jelly bean rocks. They're Edible Rocks. Oh, are they gray with speckles? I've yeah, seen they look perfectly like rocks. Oh, they're lumpy. Yeah, they're lumpy and sugary. And um, I bought a little baggie of these and I went over to his place. And uh, before he came home from kindergarten, I went down to the beach and I placed one of these rocks next to every clam shell that was down there. And when he came home, I said, David, do you want to go down to the beach and take a walk? And he said, yes. And I took him down there and I said, David, did you know there are some rocks you can eat? And he said, no. And I showed him, like, you have to be really safe about it. And so I picked up a regular rock and I poked my finger into it. And I said, if so, if your finger can't go in the rock, then it's not an edible rock. And I threw it down. And I picked up one of the edible rocks and I said, but if your fingernail can go in, then you know it's an edible rock and you can just go like this. Mmm, they were bright pink on the inside, and his eyes just lit up. He was so happy. We spent the rest of that afternoon just zooming around the beach, trying to find edible rocks and eating them. <coughs> and then 12 years pass, and I've never told a soul this story. And I'm on the phone with my little sister his little sister too. And for some reason, the subject of jelly beans comes up and I tell her the entire story and she gets off the phone and she immediately goes and tells the whole thing to him. And later I get a message from my little brother that just says, a telephone message that says, I, I hate, hate you. you. I've believed this for years. Even recently, I have walked with my friends and I have told them do you know that there are some rocks you can eat? And they've just kind of looked at me weird. And this entire time, I've, I've believed that there were edible rocks out there and, and I've been searching for them. <laughs> I am evil, says Priya.
I love that. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> cool. <clears throat> so little bit of self-promotion. This is my Patreon page. This would be a good time to take a screenshot if you feel like you would like to see these kinds of films right when they come out and, and know about the insider scoop, see some documentaries about the behind the scenes, about how these films are made. And it's just patreon.com slash Stefan Gruber and you can join for a dollar or more. And we have a few of the Patreons here today. So thank you for being here. <clears throat> yeah. So, and then I know folks wanted to see the other films. And if we have a little time at the very end, maybe we'll we'll throw on Aniel or maybe we'll save that for another workshop. So let's come back to here. And I don't think I need to share screen anymore. So I'm gonna come back to this. I'm gonna go big here. And yeah, next I wanted to share with you my method of introducing frame by frame hand-drawn animation, which hopefully you can do with just the stuff around your house. And yeah, at this point, if you have not gone and found a book or a notebook or a post-it pad like this and a pen, then this would be a good time to just take a minute while I get set up and go and get those things. Let's get vase stasis pinned. That's the one we want. That's my D and D character's name. That's why it says vase stasis. Let's see here. Is a twenty-page post-it pad no enough? Yes, it is. I would say even if you have two pieces, if the, if you can't find a pad or anything like that, even if you have two pieces of paper, it would be enough for this. That would be the emergency, that's all I've got left kind of situation. Okay. We have started the video and we're going to flip it and go like this. I am doing the two video setup. I hope that's okay with everybody. This is um, something that I had custom built for myself. I call it a raccoon. I call it a raccoon because it's got the stripy tail like this. And what it is, is it's just a bunch of wood. Take this away for a second so you can see. But this is my capture station for animation. So I have a very simple app on my phone that's called iMotion. And I can capture 4K video with iMotion with this sort of setup like this. And the whole thing looks like this. And as you can see, I can take the plexiglass out and I can put it at different levels for different zoom levels. That's the raccoon. Yeah. And um, my friend Aaron Wendell built it for me based on my designs. And I want to make a bunch of them for other people too. It's kind of nice. Also good for just um, doing this kind of thing. So let's see where Vase Stasis is. There's so many people here. I'm so glad you could all make it. Kelly. Hey, friend. We'll just a million people in here. Huh, I don't see base stasis. Let's do this. Michael, do you see base stasis? Could you help me pin that? Um, yeah, let me look. I saw it before. I know. Is the camera on? There it is. You want me to yeah. pin that? Oh, very nice. Okay, cool. Very cool. And then I think I got to do this and then drop it down. And then I'm going to hide all this. And yeah, so now we have this setup right here. You may still be able to see my face and stuff, but now we have this. Okay, so I will trade you an entire real beaver 
no, be beverage? What is it? Little beaver family for a DIY plexiglass deck. <laughs> um, it's a deal, Libby. It's a deal. I'm going to hold you to that. I want a beaver family. Do you really have beavers at your house? Okay, cool. So, hmm. What app did you say you used for your camera? I use an app that is called iMotion. Yeah, Sammy's got it. Sammy, have you used it? Has, have other people used iMotion? Is that a blue fur desk? Yes, it is. This is a blue fur desk. It's so furry. And I'm gonna go up one more level here. Right there. I think that's gonna be a nice, yeah, and, you, and that way you can see more of the blue fur, you know, that's essential. Okay, this is very simple. So at a party, like a wild party that my dad was giving, there is this local celebrity in Seattle. If you live in Seattle or you've spent much time here, you might have met this person because he goes to every art thing in Seattle. His name is Buddy Foley. And he and my dad were like twins in college in the 60s. And they, are, they couldn't be more different now. Buddy Foley is like this wild eccentric person who has never he's, he's just always found some free way to live in some warehouse or something like that and he does these airbrushed t-shirts and he sells ladybugs on the side of the road and he's got a huge long feather in his cap and he was always like my eccentric uncle and he once pulled me yes the ladybug man yes justin you know this so um he was the very first person to ever show me how to animate. And what he did is he just took the corner of a book, like, let's say this is a book. I probably should have described an actual book. Um, and we're going to do it with a post-it note here. And you can do this along with me if you like. And you just go to the bottom most page. You want to hold the rest of the pages thick like this in your hand. And essentially with your thumb, you're going to be able to flip eventually, right? and see this run like a flip book. Are the math books? Yes, they are. He, he, he also sold math books. So now you're gonna take your pen and you're gonna do a very simple thing. You're just gonna make a dot. Make a dot in an area where you can have plenty of room to move around. I'll give everybody a chance to get situated and make their first dot on the bottom page. Don't make the mistake of making the dot on the top page. We're going all the way to the very bottom page first. Okay, now that we've had a little chance to do that, you can flip to the next page. And what you wanna do is look through that page to see the dot that you made previously. Now, if you have a very dark color on your page, or if you have a very light utensil, like a pencil, you're not gonna be able to see through, but there's still a trick around that. You can take the most recent page that you have flipped and you can just kind of go back and forth like this. That gives you a idea of exactly where your dot is. What I want you to do is draw another dot next to it. And then you can go back to that same motion you were just doing and go back and forth like this to see that the dot has moved its position just a little bit. Next to or on top? Next to. It should be touching it. It should be just kissing it. Yeah, and whatever direction the dot is now moving, which you can see by flipping it back and forth. You can see my dot is moving from, that's our rabbit. You can see my dot is moving from here, going in that direction, if I just flip back and forth like this. So whatever direction it is, I want you to take a note of it, and you're going to go to your third page, third page, and make another dot going in the same direction, continuing. So it's kissing. So I'm gonna show you sort of a close-up of this. And the close-up kind of, it works like this. If you made a dot here on one page, 
you're going to make a dot that kisses it on the next page. So it should overlap a little bit, as, uh, ideally. While we're right here, let's look at what happens with different kinds of overlapping. So if I overlap, if I overlap like this, I'm getting a kind of medium speed dot. The dot is moving at a medium speed. If I overlap quite a lot, how does that change it? See it in the text. Slower speed, exactly. And if I want it to go faster, I can do this. And that will make it go faster, but it also do something that's called strobing. And it doesn't look exactly great unless you're going for a kind of stroby video look. Now, if something has moved so fast that it overlaps this far, there are a few tricks. And if you are a fan of cartoons and classic cartoons, you have probably seen these things that are called smears and multiples. So instead of making your dot go all the way over there, what I want you to do instead is make your dot smear all the way to there, like this. So the dot goes from here and then it smears all the way to there. So it's, if it's going so fast that it no, no longer overlaps its previous self, then those are gonna become smears. And you can make your dot go faster by smearing it farther. So all these are, believe it or not, they will read it instead of looking like tubes, they will look like the dot moving around as long as at some point it slows down. So the longer it is, the faster it is. And now I'm starting to slow it down. It still overlaps, but it has those smears and it's slowing down even more. And now it's back to just being a dot. So now it's going at normal speed again, overlapping, overlapping, overlapping like that. So let's go back to our original here. And I'm gonna keep on dotting and you can just keep on flipping pages and dotting and we can do this and it can be kind of a meditation. And if you feel like you want your dot to move a little faster, now you know what you can do. You can make it a tube or a little line. And if you want it to come closer, what would you do? You want it to come closer to the camera? And sorry if this sounds at all ped pedantic. I teach to high school students normally, so I do a lot of I do a lot of inquiry based learning. Um, bigger, exactly. Yeah. So if you want it to come closer to the camera, which I am going to do, we are going to make it bigger. So not only is it moving left, but it's moving bigger. And I don't really recommend you flip your pages until you've gotten about 20 pages in. I know somebody had a, only a 20 page book and that, that might be as far as you go before you return back to the beginning and add other kinds of details. So here's my dot growing bigger. You could also get weird with this if you have colors nearby, you could just get weird with this and like, okay, now I want my black dot to start to be a blue dot. Experimental experiment. And now that it's a blue dot on the next frame, the, the main idea here is change. Animation is the art of change and motion taking place. And my mentor taught me, my mentor is Jules Engel, the wonderful Hungarian animator um, and designer who worked for UPA and worked on Mr. Magoo and did the color design for the mushroom sequence in Fantasia and is just like my heart. I really love this person a lot. And uh, Jules Engel would say that animation is more related to dance than to drawing. This is more about movement and dance. And if you want to become a better animator, it's not about being, it's not being able to not about being able to make your cool drawings move. It's about being able to make movement at all. It's about make, it's not necessarily how to make your detailed cool drawing move. It's about how to make a drawing move in a detailed way. So you should go see Modern Dance if you wanna be a better animator. 
So here I am, I've kind of switched over to this light blue. And, um, and since change is the thing that I'm uh, preaching here, I am going back and forth from having a very light dot. Exactly. To making a dark dot. And what that does is when you're going from light to dark, it really feels like it's traveling through shadowy areas. So I might make like a dark line go through it like that. You know what? I'm going to come down one level here. Our bunnies have found the washing machine and they're breaking it. Hang on one second. Yeah, our bunnies look like um, they look like lint, and we have like a lot of lint around the washing machine. And I think that they relate. So it's a comfort zone. We'll just let them do it. Dust bunnies, exactly. Okay, so I have gone at least to twenty frames. This is the point where I recommend you flip your your flip book. If you are anywhere close to me, I think I am around 20, 25, maybe 30 frames. Um, I got a direct message. Where's that from? Slower. Oops. Oops. Okay, cool. Yeah. So this is the point, and I'm going to come even lower now so that you can see the details of this. This is the point where I like to give you this tip. The tip is it goes against your instinct. So your instinct is that you have gotten this far in your animation and that you should grab these pages and flip them. But I really recommend you do not do that. What I recommend instead is that you close your entire flip book before you flip it. Even if this is the corner of a book or anything like that. And hopefully you have a book that has pretty smooth pages. Maybe I should have warned you about that first, but um, I can't think of everything. So close everything first and if you want to guess why in the chat, you can. So you take close the entire thing first, and then you can flip it and see what this motion is. Oh, so I have a little dot. It's getting lighter. It's kind of become a cat eye at the end. And it's doing this range of motion that I have been trained to do, and that is to think of the motion as curves and curves that go a little slow around the edges and go a little faster when they're on lines. Most things move that way. Most things don't just move in a straight line. One of the only things that moves in a straight line is a car. A car moves in a straight line, and then when it hits a wall, it stops all of a sudden. Almost nothing moves like that in our world. And if you look, you'll see that branches are moving in arcs. You'll see that bicycles are moving in arcs you'll see that the sun is moving across the sky in an arc and almost everything is an arc. So the only thing that isn't is a car. So, <laughs> um, there we go. Let's just keep on going. Unless there are any questions so far, just drop them in the chat. Oh yeah. So um, nobody guessed about why you don't just grab the pages you've made so far and flip them. See my smears, should I see them? I see my smears, should I see them? I don't know, does it look good, Susan? Do you want, do you want me to do the smears? I'm gonna do smears next so that I can give you an example. Um, here is the reason you don't grab the pages you've done so far. The reason why you don't just flip these ones right here is because you're gonna start to dog ear unevenly your flip book. And you always want the bend that happens naturally in your flip book over time to be evenly distributed amongst the pages. Does that make sense? Oh, I am that guy, but I'm being called away. No, that's okay. Okay, Andy, take it easy. Jamie's smears look bad. Oh no, everybody's smears are looking bad. Okay, let's do, uh, let's do some common smear problems. Okay, you're all are jumping right into advanced stuff. Let's, I guess I was, I guess I was teaching it too. 
So here is a common problem with smears, and this might be what you're doing. You could tell me if, if that is true or not. And that is that when you make a smear, this is a dot moving in an arc over to this direction. What a lot of people will do next is make their next smear here, but that doesn't work. What you wanna do is your smear has made it all the way over here and you have to think about it as being made up of many dots, right? And however far it has gotten, that is the dot that you wanna overlap. So my next smear isn't overlapping a bunch of the dots. My next smear overlaps just the last dot that was there. So it goes here like this. And that should make it move really fast. And you can even make a move zigzaggy like that or like this. It can curl in on itself. This is all split second movement. And honestly, probably the best way to make your smears work is to toss them in between fast movement, medium movement, and slow movement and just allow your dot to do slow for a little while then go to medium and then zoom into fast and then go medium speed and then go slow speed again so once again this is slow speed super overlapped like that <laughs> that's all right priya yeah no problem no problem yeah and also folks if you just want to doodle alongside this on your post-it note and um do that kind of thing that's okay too this is way too if this is making you anxious please don't please don't feel obligated ah i put them all next to each other and they looked like worms exactly see i think you did this they're too close together so and that's that's a common problem actually and a lot of animators didn't know this even in the 60s they would make these smeared animation pieces and you can sometimes see it that there will be a character and the character is running and so they have speed marks up behind them and this you know all originated in comics so you would see these speed marks and you know, all these speed marks are happening and the speed marks like this is the kind of thing you can see in video if you pause a video and somebody's moving fast enough they will be smeared and the reason that that smearing is happening is because it is it is allowing your eye to connect one object to another. And that's why the smears happen. They, you, your eye needs to be able to connect the two. And you can, you can get this just by moving your hand very quickly in front of your eye right now. You will see a smeared hand. It is trying, your brain is trying to connect one hand to the other and, uh, and make, you know, make sense of what, what the thing is that is moving. And, uh, and so what I was gonna say is that the mistake that happened in the 60s is that people would make the characters overlap too, too close and then still have the smear marks. And what that ends up looking like is it just looks like somebody's running and has smeared paint behind them. So it doesn't look right. The smear connects two characters who have two instances of the same character who have gone so far away from one another that they would have to be connected by smears for our brains to connect their motion together. So you would never make this in-between character. You always, if you're making a character that's moving fast enough to do smears, the smears connect the two motions. Does that make sense? This is an advanced concept. Okay, if you have more questions about that, I'm happy to cover it. How are we doing on time? 4.37, okay, cool. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, so let's just take a, you know, five more minutes to play around with your flip book. And if somebody wants to share a flip book they've been making, we can do that. I am going to um, show an example of doing the smeared animation in the actual flip book so that you can see. And I am going to slowly switch over to another color. And this time it's going to be, I'm going to go with like really vivid 
uh, make the dots bounce. Yeah, you can totally make the dots bounce. Do you know how you would do that? So here I go. Libby D. Or maybe we can watch another one of your animations as our end of workshop treat. Okay, that sounds good. We can do that. So here I go with that dot that is still moving around. And I'm going to make it go fairly fast now. It's overlapping. I can see through. So overlapping all the way down here. Um, a bounce is very easy, actually. It's one of the very first things you ever learn. And all a bounce is, is you just make a splat. It should just look like that. You know, when the bounce hits, when the bounce hits the ground, when a ball hits the ground, it flattens for a second. And that's what builds up the velocity for it to bounce and continue upwards. So this is a ball bouncing down onto the ground. And then on the next frame, I'm still gonna make it flat and I'm going to make it continue in the other direction like that. And then we're going really fast. This is a lot of velocity happening right now. Yeah, so it's going pretty fast. And right now I'm doing a outline only and that really allows me to see through the page and also speed up and feel like I feel connected to the motion of this animation. Um, and I intend to go back and fill in the, the shape later. In fact, later is now because I've already allowed it to bounce and fall, exit the screen. So let's look at it really quick and see if it looks any good, hopefully. Yeah. Marker is a Dick Blick brand. Yes, it is. It's Dick Blick's, it's Blick's version of the Copic marker. And I have to say, I think it's an improvement, to be honest. I think I prefer them over Copics these days. And one of the main reasons is that they don't roll away. They have these edges. So they're just like, shoop, sharp. I like them. And also Blick gives a nice artist discount, uh, teacher discount, I think. Maybe not artist discount. So there it is. Dot becomes magenta and bounces away. Copics, <laughs> I like that too. Nice. And then, so, like I said, I was going to fill it in and I'm going to do it with a colored pencil because I like mixing ink and pencil quite a lot. I think it looks good. And since I have this magenta and animation is a subject of change, I'm going to go back a few frames and let the magenta come in kind of slowly like this. Oh, Guess where this came from? Nico, Prismacolor watercolor. Remember giving me this set when you moved away? Yes, you did. You were nice to me. I still have some of your plants too. So there is a filled in one. I'm just going in and filling in all of these. Another cool thing, another way you can kind of emphasize the smear is you could go a little bit softer as you go away from it. It's like the color is leading the animation and the, um, the back of it is a little less colored. Hmm. Smears and multiples. Did you ever follow that Tumblr? It was really cool. I haven't, I haven't looked at it in so long, but um, it would take still frames of chunks of animation where they would do a smear or a multiple. Lots of that, lots of that stuff in The Simpsons, lots of shots where somebody like a character basically looks like this. Like Homer has to get from here to here really fast. So Homer is made up of many eyes kind of going from here to there, to here, to here, with the nose there, and then there, and then there. And I don't know how to do Homer, but um, let's say it's Bart, actually. So here's Bart in a big smear, making their way all the way over to here, right? That's a smear. That's actually a smear and a multiple. Animators might even do this kind of thing where they multiply the eyes even more in between 
to emphasize that movement so that if this is a very quick rushing of the head, then Bart might look like this going from here, swishing all the way over to here, and then they would return to normal drawings again. Whoa, come on to the after party. There's an after party. Dude, I'd love to chill. Okay, and we're at 4.43. Oh yeah, um, please share your work tonight uh, with the hashtag Friday Night Comics. It'd be cool if you did that. I would love that. And if you want to take any screenshots and share those too, that's totally okay with me. So, hmm. <laughs> Stefan, you usually at this point, if you want to see other people's flip books, we'd ask people to uh, go to uh, reactions and raise their hands. Okay. If you'd like if you to want to that. show your flip book, go to reactions and, sh and raise your hand. I don't see any hands. Okay, <laughs> no <nervous>. problem. <laughs> you all want to watch a cartoon? We can watch another cartoon. Oh, I also... Um, yeah, maybe we share stuff through with, with the hashtag and just chill and watch some more cartoons. I also make comics and I wanted to show you some comics I made. Would it be all right if we just kind of moved over to that for a minute? Sure. Okay. Yes. Okay, I wanna show you first a comic that I made a bit ago that sold out. It's called Both Worlds Fair and I sold it at Short Run for many years and I'm really proud of it. I did the covers with uh, on a copy machine, black on black. And so they look like so. And we've got a little rabbit who's sitting there looking at a big bright city. It's called Both Worlds Fair. And Both Worlds is kind of a, um, a set of characters that I've been working with for a really long time. And I wanted to show it to you because not too many people have gotten to see it. I think I only made about 30 copies of it. Uh, but I want to publish it for real one day. So this is Both Worlds Fair. And it was from a bit ago. I really am proud of this drawing of a comet that is like a side view of the organs that are inside of a living comet. They're made up of little like constellations. And this is the Northwest Star. This is the horse cozy. And then I, I thought maybe Skittles were all along its tail. And a bunch more going on. It's basically a story of these two characters who are really good friends and share a lot of their, um, they share a lot of their tips about how to take care of each other's mountains and planets. There, it's a very cosmic sci-fi deep future story about two non-binary living satellites uh, who are kind of, they're, they're artificial intelligences. And lately, uh, somewhere near the end, this character, Jake, really gets to the point where they can't sleep at night and they, they just stare at this bright city. And it's kind of a metaphor for my own media addiction. And looks like that. And I wanted to show you the originals were all drawn in this notebook right here. And they are right here. So they look like this. And I just drew them right straight in. Ink first, no messing around. This is probably one of the only chances to see it in full color because I've made it in black and white for the print. And each of these pages. Um, I, like, I like to just go straight to ink. I'm not really much of a penciler and inker kind of person. I just like to rock it just go straight in and stream of consciousness build these stories so that's what i did with this and then i made some more color pages at the end that didn't really make it in this like i often like to make beautiful people little drawings at the edges of pages and here's a, a big laid out version of this character who's like a deity to me, kind of a character who is um, it's a character that I, I mystically 
believe I both created and who has helped create me. Like we have, we have helped each other exist. And this is the kind of character that I, I honestly, on a, on, a, on a spiritual, religious kind of level, I believe this character exists and is behind me and with me and protecting me. And they're like, they're like the deity of Stefan's life. And I draw them as a character in my comics quite a lot. Thanks, Lily. And these are collaborative drawings with Theo Ellsworth and Sean Christensen and Andres Arp, all buddies that come and stay with me when it's time for um, short run, they come and stay with me. So this is my, my own and Theo Ellsworth, Andres Arp and Sean Christensen, all just kind of like making a collaborative drawing together. And I have one other comic I want to share, and then we'll end with an animation piece, or and maybe even hang out at the after party. So this is my very first full color comic, and it is 16 pages. I've been working on it since the summertime. It started as a project at Clyde Peterson's artist in residency called The Fellowship, which is on Guaymas Island. And yeah, and um, Centigons is available. While both worlds fair is no longer available, and, and you know, I mean, I think I have one copy for myself, and then like one waterlogged copy that I need to reprint it. Centigons is available and is really cheap. It costs five bucks, and it's a sixteen-page comic. I'm gonna go a little higher here. And is made in a very similar way to the other one. And it was edited by a very wild feral person whose name is Future, who lives up in Bellingham on a really cool um, piece of property called the, uh, the Lookout Arts Quarry, which is mostly acrobats and stuff living up there. Pretty neat place. And yeah, I made this comic with Future helping me edit it along the way. And then Future made a thousand copies of it and is selling them through his website, which is Neoglyphic Media. So if you want to get a copy of this, then I recommend you take a screenshot right now or plug this into your um, plug this into your web page. You can go to neoglyphicmedia.com. And then also another plug for my Patreon. You can become a Patreon for a dollar or more and always find out about when these things come out. And as an added bonus, I really want to show this to you. All of my Patreons became characters in this book. So every single object and character was named after somebody who has helped support me as an artist. So there is my friend Tasha, Nico, who is here. Um, three people named Sam are hanging out, having tea together. Even the little mushrooms and drops of sap and witch's butter and taste. There's some living taste buds named Janet and Shani and Josh. All these are the people who are on my Patreon. So it's really, might be really fun to join the Patreon. I don't know. I mean, it would benefit me a lot, of course. And, uh, but I think it would benefit you too. I think you'd have a lot of fun joining. And... Is that enough? Does that leave us enough time to watch Aniel? I think that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna end the day with Aniel. Thank you, David Hart, for joining my Patreon. Oh my gosh, you make me so happy. Okay, here is, I'm gonna do screen share again. And where are we, where are we? We're going to go to, oh yeah, share sound, share, and I'm going to go to Google Chrome, I'm going to go back to Vimeo, and we're going to watch Aniel, and then we'll call it a day. Oh yeah, there it is. Okay. So this is a film that is all digitally drawn in Adobe Flash. In 
France, I stayed with a couple in the countryside whose job it is to train athletes to visualize pure color when they're trying to achieve new levels of performance. They had a daughter named Anielle, who was so cute. She would speak these long streams of French at me, none of which I could understand. But I could tell that each phrase was ending in a question. All I could do is stare in admiration of her endless energy. The one word I learned which was useful was champignon. If I said it, she'd get really excited and grab my hands and bring me over to this horse field next door to search for wild mushrooms. spent one day floating around in their pool. Anielle joined me, and we tried to retrieve the various dead bugs that were floating around in the pool. The bees were tricky, but the ladybugs are the ones we really felt sorry for. We'd come at them slowly from below the surface of the water, leaving the ladybug propped at the tip of our finger, and then glide over to the side of the pool to watch their bodies dry in the sun. Somehow, we agreed upon this method, that if we blew softly on them, and focused really hard on them, that we could bring them back to life. And it worked. Each ladybug took about 10 minutes of our combined efforts, and then really slowly, a leg would unfold, and then the rest. And then the little ladybug could get back up on his feet, and then he could just fly off. We were amazed by each little resurrection. And on that visit, we saved many ladybugs' lives. Big shout out to the Northwest Film Forum who took this film and made a 35 millimeter print of it. And they did animated, they did um, animated films before their feature films for a while, as is the tradition in movie theaters. So somewhere there exists, I have one copy of it. And then um, Northwest Film Forum also has a copy on 35 millimeter. And <clears throat> I'm gonna repin this one right here. Now I'm back to my face. Okay, putting away the raccoon. Now we can just look at the fuzzy blue table. Are there any questions before we uh, wrap this up? We had a question. Did you draw the whole thing in flash, directly in flash? Yes, drew the whole thing directly in flash. Yep. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other apps to recommend besides iMotion? iMotion is to capture. iMotion uh, is to capture. I like iMotion for capturing tests. I like Dragon Frame for capturing the professional level film. Like when you're really ready to capture for real Dragon Frame. When you wanna composite different things that you have made that you've captured, like you want the character to float on top of a background, then After Effects is really nice. Although every time I wanna use After Effects, I usually hire a friend who knows how to use it to do it for me because it's really, it's, I have taken classes and I've tried to learn it and it's, it's, it, it's not intuitive for me, but, um, but it is nice to, it is nice to get the kinds of effects you can get with it. 
Fedora, Fedora is asking, what kind of camera do you use with Dragon Frame? Um, just any kind of DSLR camera. Uh, a, it's a regular film camera, as long as it has a video feed in it. And Suzanne is asking, what did you use for the Ladybug film? What kind of camera? Or what do I oh, use? I don't know. I was just what I used. So there's no camera used because it's all digital. It's all drawn in, it was all done, drawn in Adobe Flash. It was all drawn using a mod book. If anybody's really old school, you might know what a mod book is. A mod book is, uh, it's a Mac from the early 2000s where you would send the Mac into this company and they would rebuild it with a uh, touch screen on the top and, and your own like pen. And then they would send it back to you and you'd have a mod book. You'd be, you basically have like an iPad from today, but you could use it with your Mac. It was really nice. It was like a Cintiq, but it was portable and you can move it around. You might still be able to find a mod book or two online and get a mod book, but you'd have a, like a really old operating system. Flash was retired, I believe, right? Um, yeah, so they use Adobe Animate now, which you can still use. And, and the SWF format is the thing that really got retired. It's because it didn't have great security. But um, you can still use Flash, which is now called Animate, and you can export to QuickTime or something like that. So you can still use it. It's still great, a great animation program. What do, what do I think about life lapse? I don't know what life lapse is. Maybe time lapse? Susanna Sinclair? Yeah, you can, you, I, I love time lapse. What? I'm against time lapse. <laughs> <laughs> no, time lapse is cheating. <laughs> That's going way too fast. Thank you so much, everyone. We're out of time, but I think we got an after party. Who's going to the after party? I'm gonna yeah, go. Susan, do you want to paste oh. that link one more time so people have I can, it? and, and um, there's a gentleman up top that has his hand up. I don't know if that's been addressed or not. Yeah, I can stay another minute if you've got another question. Cedar Bushu. Yeah, did you want to share your flipbook? Oh, no, I just had a question. Um, I'm, I don't know if you guys, anybody in this chat knows, but I'm looking to get a, like, I don't know if anybody's ever done this, but like a nonfiction horror comic done about like life in a certain area, or would that not be something that many people have done? This is something that you're trying to create or you're trying to find a collaborator? I'm more a, a collaborator, someone, I give them the, the, what I want done and then they help do it because I'm trying to do outreach for my community. So I was thinking people like comics and words are worth more, I mean, pictures and words together are worth a lot more. I'd recommend following a lot of comics artists on Instagram, but it's, it's, it's hard unless you, you're, you know, have money to pay artists to draw for you. Um, if you're looking for somebody to do it voluntarily, that can be hard. I tried to do that. And then I just, figured out I needed to learn to draw better myself yeah. because nobody would draw my my stories for free which is all I have it's, it's complicated yeah please post your animations friends I really want to see them with that hashtag on it what is it Friday nights Friday I night comics put the whole spiel it's uh yeah hashtag, hashtag. Friday night comics but also tag comics workshop uh, and Hutch Owen, that's Tom's. And you're on Instagram too, aren't you, Stefan? I am, just my name, Stefan Gruber on Instagram. And uh, I do a lot of Instagram lives too. So. Is that right? I just put it into, into chat. Did I spell it yeah. right? No, no, with an A, right? What's that? Uh, yes, uh, it's Stefan Gruber. Right. We got it. Michael has it. And then I also dropped just now the um, Patreon link in case you want a um, quickie of it. Oh, yeah. And your other links would all, I, I would assume most people can find all your links on Instagram, yeah? Um, yes, my, on my Instagram, my, um, my Patreon is linked as, as the main thing on there. Fantastic. 
That was a nice surprise. Thanks for we're coming, gonna everybody. Right we're going to do it again next Friday. We're going to do it again next Friday. We do it again and again and again. We always do this. So fun. How do people present the, the, the flip books? I would just say shoot a video of it, post it on Instagram with that. The video of yourself flipping it. You mean right you might need a third person to hold the camera while you do the flipping right or you got to get you, you got to build yourself a raccoon yeah mm -hmm. so you're gonna if, you, if you build a raccoon please tell me like please find me on instagram and show me the <laughs> raccoon you build i want to see you have, whole, you have the plans of right? feral raccoons i want to see them just eating garbage great idea well, somebody asked before, and, and now I'm curious too, do you get any distortion by putting your camera on top of the plexiglass? Almost none. Yeah. I mean, the, honestly, if, if you got any distortion, you could probably move it a centimeter and it'd be fine again, because I like this piece of plexiglass is shitty. You can see all the scratches on there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you can just scoot it a little bit and it, it'll go away from one of the um, scratches. Yeah. Why is it called a raccoon? It's called a raccoon because when I first got it, this was all raw wood. And then I wanted to spray paint it just to give it, um, to make it dark so that I would get less glare. And so what I did is I taped the areas where I didn't want paint to kind of tack up. And then I spray painted it. And I also spray painted this area right here with, um, with a paper. And when it was done, I was like, oh, it's kind of like raccoon tail. And then it's also a rack, you know, it's a rack, <laughs> it's a rack. So it's a raccoon. Yeah, let's go into business together. Where, where are my business, my business part? Shark Tank. So you, Stephen, you have one I too? Have, I have a laptop stand, which I use for teaching online, but it's not as good because it's just one level. You can't vary. Yeah, you want to be able to vary it little. a little bit, but, it, but that's nice. That still helps, doesn't it? I might use it to shoot my flip book. Yeah. These are commercially available laptop stand. But nice. Not as good as a raccoon. Yeah, it sort of looked like, um, God, it looks like a very like ornamental candle holder or something too. It's kind of fancy. Maybe they could be can double as candle holders. You can do all kinds of things with this. Yeah. A half menorah uh, <laughs> laptop stand. Yes. Well, this is so much fun. Thank you, everybody. I'll Thanks see for you. coming, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Bye. Thank for you. Now. It was super fun. Thanks. Thank you. I had a good time. It was good to so meet much. you all.